Hello and welcome to the NDTV WEF debate here at Davos. And uh, I have to say we are here to discuss India's next decade. And you can see what a difference one year makes. Last year, here at Davos, same, same discussion. And there was a mood of almost complete pessimism and what's India doing and where's India headed and what the future is. And there was an air of gloom and doom. And now here we are a year later and suddenly uh, at Davos, there seems to be a sense of great optimism. So we are here to discuss whether that optimism is entirely justified, whether a lot of work obviously needs to be done before it translates into actual action. Um, part of that optimism is because uh, the, the new government is here and we have Mr. Arun Jaitley with us who's going to tell us some of the steps that they are taking, uh, partly because of the new government and partly, of course, also because of global factors, uh, not least the drop in the price of oil. So uh, we have a great panel here to take us through what India's next decade is, is going to be like, uh, starting with Arun Jaitley, uh, who's not just the finance uh, minister of India, but also somebody really, really senior and influential in this government, uh, uh, advises uh, Narendra Modi, the Indian prime minister, on just about all issues, and therefore has a very clear sense of where the new government wants to take India and the things that need to be done. So uh, Mr. Jaitley, it's, it's wonderful to have you with us. Nuril Rubini is uh, arguably one of the most watched economists in the world, the person who successfully uh, predicted the recession, the crash of 2006, 2008, professor of economics and international business at the, the Stern School of Business at uh, New York University. Professor Rubini, you are no doubt going to tell us where the price of oil is going and what is happening with India and everything else. Uh, we'll get the full prediction from you in just, just a short while. Chanda Kochur is CEO of ICICI. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And Hari Bhartia, uh, co-chairman and founder of the Jubilant Bhartia Group. So thank you all so much for being with us. Actually, Professor Rubini, if I could just start off with you. Um, a couple of months back, uh, and you make lots of predictions, and all of them get watched at, you know, with, with great interest. One of the predictions that you made in, in November, which perhaps didn't quite get the attention that it deserved, is you said that it is possible now that the Indian tortoise could overtake the Chinese hair. Um, do you still believe that? And if so, why? <clears throat> well, I, I do believe that in the sense that uh, China is slowing down. It used to grow 10, 11%. Now growth is closer to 7%. I expect that by next year, Chinese growth is going to slow down below 6%. So the statement is a relative one. There's also is a statement about the fact that we have uh, economic reform, structural, fiscal, and otherwise. Uh, the growth rate potential and actual of India can accelerate over the next few years. I would say with basic reforms, uh, India could reach a growth rate of about 7%. To achieve a growth rate significantly above 7%, more radical reform will have to be undertaken. They're going to lead to then uh, that growth to be stronger. Uh, of course, that implies that for the first time in maybe three decades uh, or so, uh, Indian growth could be higher than the one of China. I think that's something very likely in the next decade. But the base from which India is starting in terms of uh, both per capita GDP or absolute GDP, of course, is much lower than China. So some people say that with the slowdown of China, less demand for commodities by China, the stronger growth of India can compensate for that for countries like Australia and other commodity exporters. Unfortunately, it will take maybe 20 years of 7 8% growth in India until the GDP level is going to be such that the impact of India on the global economy could become as significant as the one of China. But anyhow, this is also not a zero-sum game. You know, if right. China does well, it's good for India. If India does well, it's going to be good for China. But I would say my statement is conditional on implementing a series of reforms that are going to accelerate the potential growth rate of the country. Of course, okay. demographics, rule of law, many other things are also beneficial in the case of India when you compare it to China. OK, a series of reforms need to be rolled out. And I, I will ask you in some detail what the, what the specific steps are that you think need to be done. Um, Arun Jaitley, a lot of the reason for the, the renewed optimism is that there's a new government in place. And there are two aspects to this. One, the government is saying that it is going to do a lot of the steps that people feel are required, the reforms that are necessary, the focus on governance, the focus on implementation. And also because this is a government that actually does have the mandate, certainly in the lower house, not so much in the upper house, to be able to get a lot of its agenda through. Um, how confident are you that you will be able to push through all the steps that you think need to be taken? And do you agree with what the Professor Rubini said, that India does need serious, meaningful reforms in the next few years? Undoubtedly, I agree. But this whole debate uh, for, from the last question, uh, I just take off from that. Uh, 
Uh, I've read a decade ago or 12 years ago articles uh, written by reputed people with top international credentials as to why the Indian model is a preferred model over the Chinese model. Ours is more market determined and not entirely state determined and so on. But notwithstanding that, if we seriously introspect why we got left behind, because almost everything that could be done to take the wrong turn, we tried to do it. And therefore the possibility of even competing with China, let alone overtaking them, was completely lost out. Lots of self-goals, you're saying? Whether you call it self-goals, I think the priorities change. And instead of going into the details of the priorities, uh, I I've been explaining uh, where we erred. Instead of concentrating on high growth rates, instead of concentrating on reforms required for high growth rates, uh, we went into this notional debate of what is pro-poor and pro-rich uh, uh, and so on. And therefore, we went into the symbolism of all that. So instead of increasing productivity in India, which would bring you higher growth rate, we concentrated only on distribution. And that's, I think, uh, how the last 10 years got lost out. Once those last 10 years got lost out, I think uh, history never provides you with these opportunities over and over again. But by a curious set of circumstances, this opportunity has come back to us. It's come back to us. You have a government in India which has an absolute majority in Lok Sabha. Uh, as I mentioned slowly, we are moving in the direction of having a reasonably good figure in the upper house. Don't forget that since the last eight months, seven state assembly elections have been held in India. And those who obstruct reforms have lost all seven. The right. pro-reform groups have won everywhere. And the eighth is currently on in Delhi. This is now coupled with the global factors. The oil prices is one important factor which goes to our advantage. The fact that uh, economies which are competing with us to attract that uh, investment internationally are not exactly doing very well. Okay. So with, with these uh, all circumstances favoring us, I think we just have to take the right turns uh, and not repeat what happened in the last 10 years. If we continue to do that, and the government is fairly clear, we are determined to do that, I think uh, uh, it's reasonably possible for us to go back to our actual capacity of a high growth rate. Chanda Kochar, how optimistic are you uh, that the India will take the right turns this time? Because there are, have been a series of missed opportunities. A lot of things need to be done. Some of the decisions that need to be taken aren't necessarily always easy or comfortable ones. Uh, are you reasonably optimistic? I'm very optimistic by the fact that we are already taking the right turn. Uh, I think what is important is to continue on, on this path and continue doing what more is required. But I think the whole opening up of FDI into various sectors, which was not open so far, uh, the resolve to actually solve problems around mining, whether it's coal and so on, I think that will have a very positive impact. Uh, the solutions or the simplifications around Land Acquisition Act, I think all these are all indicators to say that we are here to make ease of doing business better. And with that, we can actually accelerate investments. So I think that's one part about what's happening uh, in India with our action taken. Uh, the second is if we look at just the macroeconomic factors, I think we are at a very, very sweet spot today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we spoke about uh, the last 10 years and how things have changed. If I were to just put in perspective, last just 20 months, how things have changed. Uh, it was just not very long ago, around May 2013, when globally this concept was coined of the fragile five. And India was the most fragile economy amongst all those. And today, what our researchers have actually looked at and seen is that in these 20 months, today amongst all the emerging economies, we have turned the strongest in terms of improvement around six factors. It's the GDP growth rate, control on inflation, control on fiscal deficit, the current account deficit, the cover of imports that we have vis-a-vis uh, you know, -vis our reserves, the proportion of external debt to total debt and to reserves. I think all those factors have improved substantially. So I would say that if we take advantage of the sweet spot and continue taking the decisions uh, and you know, keeping the pace of decision making, I think we'll get to our potential. Harry Bhartia, your co-chair here at 
here at Davos uh, this year. Uh, when you see the sense of optimism, I'm sure you're reminded a bit about 2006, 2007, when once again India was the flavor of the season at the World Economic Forum and India is going to overtake China and isn't it fantastic, you know, what's happening. And as we know, after that, things did go down and went down reasonably fast. As, as Mr. Jetley was saying, a lot of it may have been self-inflicted, but it did change. Uh, this time, is the optimism for real and is it going to stay? I think so. But first, let me tell your audience in India, you know, this time in Davos, there's an amazing interest on India. I've met almost 100 CEOs in the last three days and, uh, and they see this new government, which is a majority government, elected on the platform of governance and economic issues. So they see them driving the agenda, I think, in a very positive direction. So it's, it's nice to be here in Davos because I remember the, the last two, three years, I think there, there was some kind of hopelessness about India in terms of our ability to move into reforms. Now, but what you see, what people see here is also a very smart government. They have learned from the mistakes of the last 10 years. And I'll just give you one example. Look at financial inclusion, a project which Prime Minister started, led by our finance minister. What amazing results. I was told, in fact, today, the last uh, three days data by the finance minister, that uh, we have got 100 and we will reach a target of 120 million people with bank accounts in, the, in what? Four months, five months. Now, that's an amazing ability to deliver. So I think what I see is a government which has learned from the mistakes of others in the last 10 years. They are, and even if you look at subsidies, it's not about cutting subsidies. It's about delivering subsidies in an effective manner at the right place. And you know, people talked about ordinances. I think what is being perceived here in Davos and by the international business community that this government wants to move ahead. Even if there is blockage in the upper house, they want to move ahead, they want to deliver. And the mother of all reforms, GST. You know, we had lost hope in the last three, four years. And you think it's going to happen now? I think it's going to happen. It has moved ahead. I believe the states have agreed. And the okay. good advantage is a lot of states have now come into the fold of the ruling government in the center. So I think it's a, it's a great time. Right. Great time to move things along. I am seeing Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu here in the audience. Maybe I'll be asking him that question in a short while as to how much the states are going to, going to cooperate. But Mr. Jetley, just coming back to what actually took the mood down. The, from the, in, this is India's decade. The last time we were doing debates saying that India, this is India's next decade, what changed the mood. You're right, there were a lot of self-goals that were done. And you may have to do a lot of the damage control, and I'm sure you've been doing it here at Davos. Simple things like retrospective taxation, <laughs> policy flip-flops, aggressive tax administration. You yourself in your manifesto called it tax terrorism. Um, what, what have you done here at Davos to assure uh, many of the global CEOs that that's not going to happen again and that when India says this is the policy, it's going to stick to it for a certain period of time? You see, it's very clever people and very competent people who come to Davos. So therefore, by merely, merely, by merely, merely glib talk by us to say, uh, we won't repeat what happened, is not enough. Believe me, each one of the persons or the groups I've spoken to has been keeping a very keen and a close eye on India. They're not going to judge us by what assurance we hold out here, but actually the direction that we have been following in the last few months. Now, as far as taxation is concerned, which I thought was a big sticking point against India, the global community wants to be convinced, a wide global community, the Indian taxpayer wants to be convinced that he will invest in India only if there is a stable taxation regime. It has to be non-adversarial. I can't tell him after five years that I am now retrospectively legislating and this retrospective legislation is going to upset your entire business plans. I can't uh, come up with unreasonable demands which nobody had anticipated. And I have repeatedly, both in India and here, gone on record and said that all these controversial cases or high-profile cases that we read about have actually not yielded us any revenue. We have a very strong uh, uh, judicial structure in India. Uh, the, the, the aggrieved assessees go to some tribunal or court. They are getting favorable orders. 
And what we are left with is a losing battle and a bad name and a taxation policy which was scaring people away. Therefore, the tax department itself had to be given a clear message, and I'm uh, quite certain they've taken this message, that uh, those who are supposed to pay taxes must pay taxes. And those uh, taxes which are not payable are just not payable. So we must have a fair and a reasonable regime which has to be completely non-adversarial. And this is a message which I've been giving from day one that this government assumed office. And that's a message which we've been carrying to Davos. Right. Professor Rubini, you did say that the, the surge of India is going to be conditional on some crucial steps and some crucial reforms. You've heard some of the steps that are already being taken. What, to your mind, is the unfinished agenda and which uh, Minister Jaitley would be well advised to try and do something about? Um, well, I think there are things that are in the macro space and there are things that are in the structural and are related to each other. And one observation I'll make is that uh, last year, India was part of the Fragile Five, between current and fiscal deficit, falling growth, rising inflation, uncertainty about policy. Things have improved, but in part they've improved because of luck. I mean, the collapse in oil prices is just a manna from the sky that came regardless of any policy change. It reduced the budget deficit. It allowed the phase out of some of the energy subsidy. It reduced the current account deficit. It reduced inflation. Now it's allowing the RBI to start cutting policy rates. So all these things have improved, but they improved uh, just because of luck, uh, last year's budget was mostly a placeholder. Fair, en fair enough, the government was just coming into power. I think this year is going to be a real test of whether significant fiscal reform is going to occur. And in spite of all this positive shock coming from all improving the macro imbalances, uh, growth is improving, but there's not been exceptional, right? You know, uh, in the current fiscal year, they're just finishing maybe close to 5.5%. And what's also happening is that uh, the private sector investment has not picked up. And in order to increase actual and potential growth investment as a share of GDP has to rise significantly. Uh, there are questions of why that's happening. I think it's happening because many of the firms in the private sector are highly indebted. And that's a burden on their ability to borrow and invest and hire more. In the financial system, you have state-owned banks that have been involved in to direct the lending to favorite sectors for a long period of time and the cleanup of the financial system, creating new private banks. They're going to create more dynamism in the provision of savings to investment is going to be key and important. So there is a question of whether the fact that there are policies now to increase infrastructure spending, more needs to be done to avoid the, the restrictions that occur to do the, that investment. That investment has synergies with private investment, private public partnership. But again, uh, the good news is that the financial imbalances are improving. The bad is growth is not improving and is not improving yet because investment in private sector is not occurring. And there are balance sheet problems in the financial system, in the corporate sector, still an improvement in confidence, but not to the level in which the private sector is significantly uh, investing more. And then there is the agenda of a long list of uh, structural reform. Uh, the government, I think, fairly says uh, we have not done maybe big bang reforms because politically harder. It's better to do gradual steps reform that over time they build up. Uh, that, that's correct, but there are big things that have to be done eventually, from labor market reform to land reform, to privatization, to capital account liberalization, to right. you know, FDI further liberalization, to even overall broader tax reform in addition to the GST one. And that's going to be the challenge of more radical reform that will be needed to significantly increase potential growth. Uh, the good half of the glass is positive that the steps are do being done. Uh, the constraints, there are lots of interest groups that are going to be against the, those types of liberalization. So, so, um Minister Jetley, obviously you, you're not going to be telling us exactly what's in the budget. I mean, feel free to do that if you, if you should so <laughs> desire. But um, assuming you're not going to tell us what's exactly coming up in the budget, uh, Professor Rubini said that the last budget was a placeholder. You have also tried to under-emphasize, you know, that not everything should be done in the budget. But those reforms that he was talking about, whether it's labor law, whether it's labor, whether it's land, some of them you're already doing. Uh, Will we be seeing this in the near future? Or will you continue to have a gradual well, approach well, going forward? Well, let me tell you, when we speak in terms of uh, the kind of reforms, uh, I always uh, prefer to understate and underplay this. But now that this question has been raised, opening out sectors like railways and defense 
it's not a small reform in an economy like India. Opening up uh, almost every conceivable sector. We have a more liberal FDI policy today than most parts of the world. Now, reforming the entire taxation structure with the GST kind of a reform. The land law, which I thought was a, uh, was a legislation which could have actually halted India's progress. It could have halted India's industrialization, infrastructure creation, township creation, housing problems, etc. In one structural, uh, in one surgical manner, we did away and reformed that law partly. It's not a small reform. The entire energy sector, now for the, from 2006 to 2014, it was a complete standstill, nothing was done. The companies which have invested into that uh, 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 had lost their credit worthiness. Uh, uh, coal was not available, which was our major resource. Uh, now we've reformed that sector completely. Mining, a major resource, we are still with an obsolete procedure now, to come out with a more modern legislation in tune with the times of the day was not a small reform. Now, these are all steps which we've been taking. From the first of, uh, uh, Mr. Hari Bharatiya just now mentioned uh, the, the financial inclusion scheme, to get, uh, to visit uh, uh, almost 22 crore out of the 25 crore families in India, barring left-wing extremism and border areas and inaccessible areas, get every Indian to be a part of that system. And not only a part of that system, you now have started immediately, from the 1st January onward, the state support subsidies going into that system. So the leakages are going to be plugged in the first phase. My problem really is when I look at investment into various sectors and increasing it in the social sectors, etc. From the kind of revenues we earn at this modest level of growth are all committed to a fixed governmental expenditure. In the last 10 years, we've added to that expenditure. So whether it's salaries, it's pensions, it's uh, uh, the defense expenditure, it's repayment of debt, and the so-called expenditure incurred because of this rights-based approach. Now, this rights-based approach was not, not always the most logical approach. Mm. To have an erroneous impression that you increase uh, 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 subsidized gas cylinders from 6 to 12, and this will completely win an election for you. It just didn't happen. Now the consumers of gas cylinders are not the poorest in India. These are, these are people uh, who have a certain level of affordability. Now right. if I had put that amount which has gone into these additional gas cylinders into India's health sector or education sector, that was a far more deserving priority. Now we have to unravel this entire process. So it's a long journey. It's a right. government which is here for a full term. And we've just about started. All right. Uh, Chanda Kochar, obviously, a lot of the private sector will also have to play a role. And that's what we keep hearing from the government uh, as well, because there will be massive investment that will be required. So one of the points that Professor Rubini was talking about, about the balance sheets of a lot of companies uh, in the private sector in India, they are heavily indebted. Interest rates are still very high. OK, now they started to come down a, a little bit, but interest rates are still very high. So is it going to be simple for the private sector to play its part? in India's next decade, or is it again going to take time for that debt burden to be unraveled? So I think the private sector definitely has to play its part in, in, in this whole investment cycle. Uh, but to enable the private sector to play that part, the most immediate requirement is to actually unravel the existing projects. I think, uh, you know, the reason why the indebtedness of the Indian corporate sector has gone up is because a lot of investments are underway. Uh, the debt has been taken for those investments and actually very good quality assets have been put on the ground. And that's the positive part of it. It's just that there are the last mile issues of either the last mile approvals or, you know, the raw material not being tied up, for instance, coal, etc., which is not allowing these projects to generate cash flows and thereby reduce the leverage levels. So I think the most important priority for all of us is now to resolve those issues around existing projects. And I personally believe that even if we, and as we are taking this whole coal solution up to its logical end by end of March, uh, and with that, if we get the 20,000 megawatts of existing power capacity working, which is not working today, we can, through direct and indirect benefits, 
add 1% to the GDP of the country. Now, not just that, that will enable the corporate sector to then start servicing the debt that is taken towards those projects. And it is only then will the private sector get that confidence, both financially and uh, you know, psychologically, to think of the next round of investments. So I think the corporate sector recognizes that there's a huge potential to invest. The corporate sector has the capability to invest, and the financial sector has the capability to support. But as of now, the priority has to be to unshackle the existing projects. And in the meanwhile, I think we can ignite some amount of investments through the government uh, projects, you know, whether it is partly on railways, partly on highways. If we start giving that kind of a push, ignite the economy, and gradually solve the existing projects. So, uh, Harry, if, if a lot of these projects did get stuck, so there was various reasons are given for it, just sloth and bureaucratic apathy, Corruption is quite often uh, blamed for it, and you know corruption in, in some of these these projects. It's often also said that one of the things that happened in India is with so much concern about corruption, quite often honest decision making was also just blocked because nobody wanted to sign a file, nobody wanted to put their signature on any piece of paper, uh, and because you know who knows who wants to get into trouble, and tomorrow the investigating authorities will come. How do you start changing that mindset? It's it's changing in a very subtle way, and I'll. I'll give you another example how, and Professor Rubini also talked about second generation of reform. See, reform is not only about what is being done at the central government. It also has large implication where state governments are involved. Because doing business in India, that's where the states, that you go to the state, and that's where most of your permissions are required, and issues about corruption. I must tell you, in Davos here, uh, and to our Indian audience, a very interesting phenomenon is happening. States are now competing with each other. Uh, finance minister was in West Bengal, Mamta Banerjee and finance minister standing on a common ground on economic issue, and West Bengal trying to market and getting investment. And look what is here happening in Davos. We have a Make in India lounge, where you get great Indian food, and we have two chief ministers, in two corners, promoting their own states. Chandra Babu Naidu is here, doing a fantastic job. If each state starts to promote investment, is promoting India. Look at the multiple effect that we will have. And I think that is a, also solves your issues about corruption. Because if states have to attract investment, they have to make it easy for doing business. And that is about reducing corruption and Inspector Raj. Right. Uh, Arun Jaitley, corruption, of course, has been a big issue in India. And corruption has two aspects to it. One is big level corruption, which is you know, at the government levels and at cabinet minister levels. But a lot of the, the if impact of corruption and really draining some of the energy out of the Indian economy is at lower levels and at grassroots level, people sitting on files. How can you and the government empower honest bureaucrats to take decisions without fearing that if they put their signature on a file tomorrow, CBI will come after them or somebody will come after them? Because that is one of the reasons why things slowed down so much in India. Not the only reason, but one of the reasons. You see, one of the great uh, setbacks of the last decade has been credibility of governance declined. And therefore, other structures became more powerful. The CAG became more powerful, the CBI became more powerful, the courts became more powerful, because the general presumption was that governments uh, act for collateral reasons and not for honest reasons. Now, this is the greatest damage which was done to governance in the last 10 years. Now, in the process, there are many decisions when you talk of these large projects. Some were held up because of environment, some were held up because of some permissions. But I can tell you, a large number of decisions are held up in governments, both at the center of the states, because everybody wants to play a game of just passing the parcel. So he who has the last, uh, who's the last in the queue to have the parcel in his hand is going to be eliminated. Similarly, in governmental decision making, which has commercial connotations, I believe we have unrealistic laws unrealistic in the modern era of uh, liberalization. The Prevention of Corruption Act in particular is a 1988 law. It was redone. It predated the 1991 liberalization. 
and almost every decision, including an honest decision, can be brought within the ambit of that law. I know for certain that three extremely honest secretaries of government of India are today being investigated or prosecuted by the CBI for decisions taken over the last 10, 12 years and decisions which were commercial decisions taken on good commercial considerations. And logically, there is no reason. I had the responsibility of the defense ministry for a brief while. And I found that everyone wanted to just make a query and ask for a clarification and send the file up. He didn't want the parcel to be in his hand mm. uh, once, uh, once the bell was sounded. Now, I, I, I personally do believe that time has come for us to review disproportionate assets. Of course, it's an offense. Bribery, of course, it's an offense. But uh, to simply say, giving an unfair advantage to a private party. Now, people who do businesses with government will get an advantage. Now, whether it's a fair advantage or an unfair advantage at the end of the day becomes a whole matter of entire discretion for which a secretary or a joint secretary will then face prosecution after his retirement for the next 20 years. So will you now, give them protection? Therefore, therefore, if you remember in this whole debate on Lokpal, etc., demands were being raised, there should be no sanctions before prosecuting politicians or, 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 or civil servants or public servants. I had always deferred with this. Now, in, in, a re, in a reactive situation, you can take these extreme positions. Speaking for myself, I do believe that time has come that even the provisions of one of the sections requires a relook, particularly Section 13.1D, under which every honest decision taken on commercial considerations could go into the ambit of a CBI investigation. I think it requires a, a relook today, particularly when, why is it that the... Uh, we had the, the bankers conclave at Pune, the Prime Minister and I were there. And all the bank had said, when some, assuming they want to settle uh, uh, with a possible company and give some discounts and recover what they can recover. Hmm. Alternatively, thinking that this is a project where you can give him some more so that he survives and therefore is in a position to rebay back. Now, a banker in a public sector bank has to take a decision on purely commercial consideration. If Mrs. Kocher took the decision as a private sector banker, nobody can touch her. But if the head of the state bank took that decision and the decision eventually proved to be incorrect, she'll be liable for prosecution. So the bank chairpersons are not uh, acting on commercial considerations. Right. And therefore, I think we have to empower the civil service. We have to empower those who are to decide on commercial considerations rather than just be swayed away by these agitations and propaganda and this notional concept of, are you pro-corrupt because you are suggesting this change? I think if you have to run the government of India and we have to go back on that 8%, 9% growth rate, we have to make these structural changes. Right, that's, that, that's, that's, that's probably music to a lot of people's ears. Uh, Professor Rubin, you just want to come to some of the bigger macro themes that have also been playing out at, at Davos and seeing how they affect India. Um, you were talking about the, the drop in the price of oil. It's been an area of concern for so many people here. For India, it's actually made Mr. Jaitley's job so much simpler. Uh, the twin deficit that we were talking about, drop in price of oil helps, you know, the current account deficit because Mr. Jaitley is now taxing, uh, you know, petrol products. Uh, it's, it's also you know, helping, helping the fiscal deficit. Do you no, see nine the... Nine times I've passed the benefit to the consumer also. But you also taxed, <laughs> so, which is fair yeah. enough. Yeah. But uh, uh, do you see this, the, the price of oil remaining at these levels, which is probably very good news for India, or going back up? Um, for now, oil prices are going to stay at current level, but I expect that uh, there will be underinvestment in new capacity as uh, high marginal cost producers, whether a share in the US or other, are going to get out of the market. But this is the bottom of those prices. And maybe oil prices by the end of this year could be closer to uh, $60 per barrel and over the medium term closer to 70 The good news is that they're not going to go probably back to the level they had uh, a few years ago, uh, but they're going to go slightly higher. And I would say overall for emerging markets, uh, we have to realize that there are many changes in the global economy that imply that what happened in the last decade is not going to happen mechanically next decade. For the last decade, there were a bunch of tailwinds are becoming headwinds. China was growing 11%. You had the commodity super cycle. You had zero policy rates and quantitative easing. Today, China is slowing down. The commodity super cycle is over. 
Uh, U.S., however, slowly has finished with QE and is going to start raising rates. Of course, if you are a commodity importer like India, you benefit from that slowdown in commodity prices. But there are also two other factors I think are important. One is that in the decade where things were easy, there were macroeconomic uh, looseness in many emerging markets, including India, monetary and fiscal and credit uh, loosening the led those twin deficits. And because times were good, many governments did not do the kind of structural reform that increased the productivity of the private <coughs> sector. If anything, many of them moved away from that towards models of state capitalism, China, Russia, but even India in the last decade, or Brazil, or South Africa, and you name it. Now that uh, has to change, and you have to go in the direction of structural reform to increase your potential growth. So the global outlook for emerging market, leaving aside the fact that oil is a positive for India, is a much more complicated one, both in terms of capital flows, global uh, headwinds, macro imbalances, need for structural reform. And I think the dividing line within emerging markets is going to be between countries like Mexico, hopefully India under the new government, and others are going to do the structural reform that are needed to increase their potential growth, and those that don't have the political institution and the social to make those important changes. At the end of the day, this is the time for doing those structural reforms. All right. Uh, Chanda Kuchar, another one of the themes that I've been hearing a lot here at Davos is on gender issues and gender disparities and gender gap. And obviously in India, there's, there's been a lot of concern about the rights of women, the attacks of women, security on women. But there is a flip side too, which is that in India, unlike many other countries, there's not really the glass ceiling isn't there to that same extent. And, you know, people can rise to the top, uh, women can rise to the top of the corporate sector without anybody thinking twice about it. What is your take on that? And I'm sure you've been asked that question often here as, as well at Davos. Yeah, one is, I think, uh, you know, on the flip side first that you spoke about, I think we as a country need to be proud to say that uh, on this issue, at least in the corporate sector, India is doing much better than many other countries in the world. I don't know of any country in the world where the banking sector, more than 50% of the banking sector would be run by women. So I I'm think that's... i think of a bank which is not run by a woman in India. It's, it's a bit tough to... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm racking so, my brains a bit. Yeah, so, uh, so I think that, that's one. The, the second is, uh, in that context, when people ask me, uh, you know, what needs to be done uh, to make this happen, frankly, I, you know, I think what most of these organizations have done, as I've seen all these organizations, is just to create a level playing field between men and women. I think as long as you create no discriminations against women, as long as you don't have inhibition saying a woman would not be able to do this job or would not be able to take that responsibility, I think women are thriving on their merit. So this is really on the corporate side. But of course, on the other side that you spoke about, uh, you know, the safety, the security of women and so on, I think we need to do a lot more. 50% uh, of our population is women. Uh, clearly, uh, to strengthen the laws, clearly to strengthen the execution of those laws and the safety security measures, we all need to do. As a country, as companies, we focus on doing this for our own women employees. But yes, we need to continue to do that. So, Bhartia, the other thing we've been hearing a lot about, obviously, is inclusion and making sure that there is inclusion. And also digital inclusion, which is the next big thing that people are talking about. Because as the internet keeps on growing, but people just get left behind if they don't have access to proper, good quality digital infrastructure. No, but one thing that has changed this digital inclusion part is the smartphone population is increasing quite a bit. So what you see is uh, in villages, uh, in cities, in urban India, that everybody has access to telephones. And now that, that cell phone gives you a lot of uh, digital access. Uh, it's anecdotal, but let me give you an example that uh, uh, we sell pizza in 180 cities and 30% uh, of the orders are online. Now, that's a sign. It's almost 50% of a developed economy. If I compare what happens in a developed economy. But this is, this is an urban example, so I would not take, extend it to the rural part of India. But uh, definitely, if 4G comes in, uh, and if the rates re remain competitive, and uh, the penetration of the mobile telephony increases, certainly it will impact, uh, uh, I think, in the digital part of India, uh, it will certainly impact. But I must, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of good things, but one of the, the challenges continues to remain for, uh, for, our, for our growth is obviously this, 
new set of youth population that is coming into the job market and uh, their employability and their education because we have double impact a rural india which is you know 50% of people are employed in the agricultural economy with uh, with 15% as part of gdp it is not sustainable so they are coming into the urban part uh, to find jobs and while the new set of young people coming into the job market the biggest challenge that we have is how do we make them employable and i think that's where business and entrepreneurship can play a very important role i think creating sustainable jobs and enterprise right so obviously employment is going to be a big a, a big big concern going forward and and there is of course this overlying theme that as the world is becoming more and more digital what does that by itself mean about the nature of a corporation the nature of business now yesterday we did hear uh, google facebook microsoft all of them were saying that the biggest the greatest public good now is is going to be the internet and having broadband access to everyone and the suggestion was made which i must get your views on 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 the fact that spectrum should actually not be licensed or sold but should be given away free because it's such a major public public good that tends your fiscal deficit a little bit so that's why i wanted your see, reaction see i just now answered your last question by saying when institutions of governance became weak the others took over you try selling spectrum free in india uh, i'll be in patiala house courts uh, for the rest of my life that's the law which has been declared by the supreme court now these discretions in indian society have been taken away from the government now if a government is to legitimately decide at some stage that to encourage a particular sector the input cost has to be reduced so that the consumers get it cheaper now these are all decisions which have to be restored back uh, uh, to governance uh, on a policy primacy now unfortunately we've had uh, uh, as a hangover of the last 10 years uh, 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 judicial parameters being laid down so i don't think uh, with the law as laid down in the 2g case in india anybody would uh, either risk or even dream of doing that i mean that's actually exactly the point in 2g which at that time you did argue that you know why was this done in a particular manner so you don't see that happening in the near future well i don't think with the law as it is today anybody is going to even take a chance as far as that is concerned all right before i turn to the audience and get some views from here i just wanted to ask each of you what could possibly go wrong uh, and we should be always watchful at a time of optimism to see what could possibly go wrong and therefore what is it that we should keep our eyes open from hari why don't you start then i'll come this way what do you think could go wrong in india see uh, i i constantly worry about uh, the education part how do we bring in this large number of people into workforce because it's the first time to give a job the first job is the most difficult part because people come from very poor families where the parents are agricultural laborers and how do you bring into the job market so how do you give them employable skills even soft skills and i think the management of that at the state level and at the central level both in terms of policy and effectiveness and the amount of money that we put into into skills and education i think okay. that's where the challenge lies actually you're talking so much about the states before and uh, let me just get Ch- chandra babu naidu and before i come to the others on that let me get his sense uh, if you can get a microphone to to mr naidu out there just wanted to ask you a uh, couple of the questions out here the competition for uh, uh, the competition among indian states to try and get investment and secondly the question of whether reforms and doing being doing good things economically is good politics you paid the price in the past by trying to be too reformist <coughs> have, has has the world changed since then no thank you now all over the world if you see even if you do populist schemes also if you do in a wrong way then automatically you will be caught and also you will be lose the elections for the last one decade it is a reflection but uh, in india as on today we are very happy for the last 7 months things are moving very positively everybody is here they are coming for the last so many years to davos this is the first time i am seeing in davos so much of a hope and also hype everybody is talking you have given a title india decade i want to correct it india century This century belongs to India. I don't have any doubt about it. 
I have seen so many investors here and also corporate sector. Everybody is talking. We are having one advantage, demographic dividend, and also biggest democracy, and also market. Above all these things, there is a stable government, and also one of the best administrator at the realm of affairs. If anything will go wrong, it is uh, beyond expectations, according to me. All right. So beyond expectation that anything will go wrong. Chanda Kochar, what could go wrong? See, India has two basic advantages. One is its demography and one is its potential for investment. And I think the same two factors can turn into disadvantage if we don't handle them well. So what could go wrong is the same demography if we do not provide employment opportunities, employability of these people, then you're going to have a problem at hand. Similarly, the same potential to invest, which can add uh, percentages to your GDP, if we do not invest in infrastructure, then that can become a bottleneck. So according to me, uh, the only thing that can go wrong is if we do not harness our potential fully. We have to work. We have a lot of strong points with us. We just have to make sure we keep working and harnessing that potential. Professor Rubini, <clears throat> what could go wrong? Well, I would say that you know, trade, globalization, and uh, technological innovation has led initially to offshoring of jobs uh, from advanced economies to emerging markets, say manufacturing for China, IT services and software, you name it, for India. Uh, but things are going to change, and the pace of change is going to be erratic, radical. Today, a radiologist in Mumbai can do the same job as a radiologist in New York for one-fifth of the salary, but tomorrow there may be a piece of software that can do it better and cheaper than anyone around the world. Today, the call center in Bangalore can do the services for United States companies, but tomorrow there'll be a series style of uh, virtual assistant can do the same kind of thing. So this is a time in which uh, initially traded globalization pushed jobs into emerging markets, but now technology is becoming increasingly capital intensive, skill buyers and labor savings. Even in China, millions of manufacturing jobs are going to be lost because Foxconn is going to go into automation. Now, India's at advantage that still labor costs are very low and you can have a buildup of manufacturing or services. It's also a domestic economy. But this is a time in which change in the world is occurring so rapid that unless you do reforms very rapidly, you could be in a situation in which the world technology and other things are going to push you behind. So this is not the time for temporizing, but actually to aggressively go in the direction. The world is becoming more globalized, competition is more aggressive, and no country, including India, can take anything for granted. Mr. Chetley, one of the questions that I'm sure you've also been asked here, Davos, as, as, as I have, is that um, is, is social cohesion a possible problem uh, going looking forward in India? Because even linked to your government and your party, there's, there is a certain right-wing and economic uh, thinking which is, helps with all the decisions and the reforms and the other measures that you're talking about. There's also a right wing when it comes to religious or social factors, which could potentially lead see, to other sort of problems. You see, with the, a great amount of difficulty and uh, past, taking the benefit of the past experiences, I think India started to accept the economic agenda as the center stage agenda of the country. So if you've seen in the last few months or even before the elections, the debate has essentially been around those issues. So a large number of other issues, political, social, caste, dynasties, families, charismas, have all taken a back seat. I hope they do continue to take a back seat. So and religious strife issues and like therefore, that. Therefore, therefore, when you ask me what can go wrong in a country like India, we must not allow this central stage agenda to be derailed or deflected under any circumstance. Now, if any of the other things happens and somehow we trip, the last government uh, tripped when it came to corruption. Uh, uh, if you remember a similar example in 1984, the government came up with, under Mr. Rajiv Gandhi with great hope. First two years were reasonably good. And suddenly uh, uh, the government tripped and then nothing seemed to be working. I think we have to be extremely careful that this roadmap that we've set for ourselves, we should determinedly, doggedly go on to this and not allow agenda to be taken over by any of the other factors which have currently taken a backseat. Including potentially your own supporters. Well, including potentially, and that's why the Prime Minister was the first one to, uh, to, to, to take a strong line against them. 
All right, let me turn to other people in the audience. Anish Kejiva. Um. Yeah, uh, just get you on the mic. You know, we've had a lot of speakers talk about the <clears throat> demographic dividend. I think in 2013, <coughs> the other dividend we really benefited from was the oil price dividend, which helped our current account and our current uh, now both our budget deficits and the Republican low inflation. The question is for the finance minister, if we were to have uh, volatility and oil prices not to get back to $200, as an economy, are we prepared for that? Right, so see, the it, audio wasn't entirely clear. Uh, so he's asking about the oil price and what happens if it goes back up. Well, once uh, uh, the fundamentals of our economy are sound, our uh, manufacturing can go back uh, to the desired levels. Our uh, investment, both private sector and international, can come in addition to public spending on infrastructure. I think we would be in a position to take the shocks. Even at 80 and $100, we've taken the shocks and still grown well in the past. So that won't derail us completely. But uh, as the professor mentioned, our comfortable level would be where the figures are now or maybe slightly higher. Right. See, Pat Luka, are you, are you one of those people rushing to invest in India? <laughs> Get more money in or if you have a question? We have a large operation in India and have been successful there. Uh, but I, I think, you know, you are, you are all right. You're on the eve of a lot of good things happening with, with oil prices, with the reforms. Uh, in the U.S., our issue is we're facing, you know, jobs and education, educating the population to take the jobs of, of today. What specifically are you doing in India to dovetail, you know, getting more education, education for what business needs, for what the knowledge sector needs? Are there specific proposals and programs on how you're going to get that better in India. We certainly need to do that in the U.S. as well. Education? Well, I've always uh, believed that this is one sector where we need to do a lot more. Uh, uh, when we started reforming in terms of economy, uh, this remained an unreformed sector. But today, fortunately, a lot of investment, even private sector has come up, institutions are expanding. We have a huge skill development program of the government, uh, uh, which has now started in order to train our people and prepare them for the jobs. This also in a relation to an earlier question that you'd asked uh, with regard to gender equality. Go to any educational institution in India. And I get a chance to visit them for convocations and so on. I am now finding across the board throughout the country, 60 to 80% of those in, in quality institutions are women. And therefore, uh, 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 when you have been providing with a level playing field, that is one sector in which you can actually see a change situation on the ground. Right, let me quickly take three or four questions and comments and then, then come back to final thoughts from the panel. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, it is truly impressive the number of reforms that are being done and the pace at which it is being done. Do you think there is enough depth in terms of the number of people that you have in terms of the depth of the bureaucracy to kind of implement all of this at the pace at which you would like? Or is it something that's going to be slow and it's going to take time, in which case you might want to condition people to expect that we're not jumping to 8% growth in the next year? All right. Great. Mr. N.K. Singh, you had a, you had a comment? Uh, my question is to uh, comment a question or whatever it is, is to Professor Rubini. But in terms of exogenous variables, which the finance minister has himself conceded, has been one of the favorable factors to propel the India story. What are the probabilities which you feel that the world could once again tip over? And apart from the factor of oil, in terms of the export market shrinking, in terms of the appetite for risk, in terms of foreign investment, what would you say are the probabilities of risks of that kind, of an exogenous nature, which India must protect itself? All right, I'll just take two more comments or questions, the gentleman there, and then I'll go down that side. Thank you. Um, Paul Meehan from Bain & Company. Just coming back to private sector investment, we heard that the private sector is not investing yet. We're dealing with unraveling a lot of sunk cost. We haven't heard too much from the panel about the growth potential in manufacturing value added, the technology sectors. 
what, what incentives are we being created to, to encourage more investment there, particularly given the high, relative high cost of capital today in India? All right. Um, Mr. Hinducha, you had a question or a comment? And then the gentleman there. Yeah. Okay, I'll come to you I'd next. I'd like to have a question with Professor Nurubini. I've been knowing him for a long, few years now. Uh, your prediction for the world global economy has been so accurate. I'd like to know what is your future prediction for the global economy? How do you see the world? Okay. And what do you think about the economical changes which are going to take place? And what is the setback going to happen in the world? Okay, while we get the mic to the gentleman there, you want to quickly respond on exogenous shock and, mm -hmm. uh, and prediction for the world economy? Well, uh, <clears throat> I would describe the global economy like an airplane that has uh, four main engines. One is the US, the other one is the Europe Eurozone, the third is Japan, the fourth one uh, is China. The good news is the US is recovering and doing better. Uh, the Eurozone has been stalled in terms of growth, near recession. Um, deflation, we'll see what the action of ECB will do. Japan made a policy mistake by front-loading his own uh, fiscal consolidation, and now they have to postpone it. And China is slowing down quite sharply. My view is going to slow down more sharply than, than otherwise. Now, in the case of India, uh, it's a less open economy than others, so it's more sheltered from global shocks, but the economy is going to open up much more given the policies to trade, to foreign direct investment, and so on. And there are certainly two channels of transmission, among others, uh, that are important. One is uh, financial flows. The country still run a current account deficit. It has to attract portfolio and financial capital. If the Fed were to exit faster than otherwise, if risk aversion because of what's happening in the world would lead to risk off rather than risk on, you could have capital outflows rather than inflows. That's going to increase the cost of capital for India. Secondly, right now, all prices are low, commodity prices are low. That are net benefits in India, that is a net commodity importer. But you can tell scenario, even geopolitical, of shocks that could lead to a shock to supply of oil, energy, or other commodities. And therefore, those are the two channels through which the world, among others, is expanding. And finally, as you open up more, of course, are being able to also grow not just through domestic demand, but net exports becomes more important. And what happens in the rest of the world affects the competitiveness of, uh, of the country. You also have a lot of foreign currency liabilities of some elements of the financial system and the private sector. If the dollar was to strengthen too much, those balance sheet effects could add to the financial constraints that they uh, corporates and the financial institution would face. All right, I think we have just a couple of minutes left, so let me get some quick, quick additional thoughts. In a uh, new Indian <laughs> government that has great importance to the manufacturing industry, right? Uh, make in India. The uh, question is, how, what kind of uh, trade policy are you going to take, uh, particularly regarding the RCEP? The, uh, if uh, India join this, uh, you know, RCEP, the, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, supply chain, the, the competition in the supply chains uh, will, will be, um, you know, uh, much, uh, uh, I'd say, it, uh, for India, it, it will be uh, very, very advantageous. The, that's right. my assessment. So what, what do you think about your trade policy? What, what are you going to do? All right, we're just to, going to, to, react to the to Minister see, of Finance. I see Amitabh Khan sitting out there. Maybe we should get him and I get an answer from him. But all right, the lady at the very last, uh, Ray and there, and then in the meantime, there was a comment from here, so if you can get one mic here. I'm going to try and squeeze all of this in. I'm told I just have a minute to go, so uh, I'm not sure, quite sure how to squeeze Very it in. Very simple question I have to the learned panel. India is not the first country to take the route to reform. There have been several others before us. So I would ask the panel, what are the two things we can easily emulate rather than reinventing from successful reforms elsewhere? And what are the two things which India will be well advised not to do, having learned from the mistakes of others? And something on lighter note with permission from Chanda, I think now that women have captured practically the banking industry, it is the economic ministries which seem to be the next frontier. Thank you. I thought they are starting to make inroads there as well. But so, Mr. Mujal, you had a comment? Uh, one of the key points that was being brought up was about employment. Uh, Mr. Minister, it will be useful for us to hear about entrepreneurship, because that is a real multiplier for job creation. Right, the lady there. Yeah. I am Sindhur Mittal. 
to add to what Mr. Munjal said, we just heard from Jack Ma just earlier today on how he created uh, from zero to $43 billion in just 10 to 15 years. So I think my question is, how do we create scale and entrepreneurship and an innovation, uh, an ecosystem for entrepreneurship? Like there is, I mean, we have Indians in the US and Silicon Valley actually creating these businesses, but how do we have them here homegrown in India and actually scale these businesses up? All right, fine. I'm going to get thoughts on all of that from, from the panelists here. But Mr. Amitabh Kant was sitting out here. I want to respond to the Make in India uh, campaign that you've been doing out here. Has it been getting receptive noises here at a time when, if you can get a mic to him. <coughs> yeah. So how many, how many factories have moved to India no, in the I, last I think week? it's important to uh, realize that we're in a globalized world. And, uh, you know, India's... If India has to compete, India has to uh, be a very efficient manufacturer. And uh, India has to compete in several areas. It has to get into areas of biotechnology, nanotechnology, advanced manufacturing, but it also has to get into labor-intensive labor manufacturing in a very big way. And we are focusing on many of these areas. But I think the key thing to all this is the focus on, huge focus and emphasis on ease of doing business in terms of just sheer scrapping of rules, procedures, uh, you know, acts, rules, laws. And to my mind, over a long period of time, that will give India the competitive edge. All right, I'm told we have to wrap, so maybe some quick final thoughts from you on some of the questions and themes that you've heard. Well, two, two, two particular points. Um, uh, I don't find any resistance from the civil service or the bureaucracy in India. And I see, particularly if the government and the political executive is absolutely clear about what course to pursue. With regard to laterally inducting talent into the government or into the system, I think governments in India have been increasingly open to it. The last government also in some measure tried to do it. After all, they got the governor of the Reserve Bank as the chief economic advisor at that time. We've got the new chief economic advisor. We've got the vice chairman of the Niti Aayog. And I, I'm, I'm quite certain uh, uh, before the factories moved to India, the best minds also must be available to the government of India irrespective of where they are. In terms of incentivizing uh, manufacturing, it's very much on our agenda. Even though we had only a few days during the last budget, we did give to MSE, ME and, and so on uh, uh, several incentives because we wanted the sector to pick up. And that's a priority which is fairly high on our agenda. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being with us. We're talking about the mood in India. It's certainly upbeat. It's certainly positive. May well become a lot more upbeat if India actually wins the World Cup in a couple of months from now, which doesn't seem. <laughs> actually, I should ask you that question. You've been so involved with cricket. Is, who, who do you think is winning the World Cup? <laughs> Quick guess. I'm not so sure what kind of uh, pitches the Australians and the New Zealanders have uh, <laughs> prepared. New Zealand, the pitches I'm particularly scared of. All right, In so. Meanwhile, let's work hard enough to make the winner of world economy as India. All right, so whatever happens in the World Cup, make the winner of the world economy India, maybe that's, that's an easier bet right now. Thank you all so much. It was a, it was a pleasure having all of you with us. Thank you.